Good evening and welcome to Behind the Headlines. Today is uh, Wednesday the 14th of September 2022 and in this programme today uh, we will be discussing Her Majesty the Queen and her legacy that she's left behind uh, for our nation but also for the Commonwealth. We'll be uh, looking at her Christian faith and the impact that that had on her and her nation and her reign over the past 70 years. But we'll also be looking into what type of king we think uh, King Charles will be, how will he reign, and uh, will he reign and follow his mother in terms of her, uh, her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Or will he choose the path of the globalist? Will he follow the agenda of the World Economic Forum? So these are the big issues that we could be discussing in tonight's programme. Um, Reagan, it's, it's great to see you. And, uh, you know, this, I mean, just, I'm probably glued like everyone else really is to, to our mainstream media at the moment. And just seeing the... Um, uh, the Queen's coffin uh, and all the traditions uh, that going back centuries uh, mm. regarding um, the, the Queen's funeral and these 10 days of mourning that, we're, that we are going through. And, and the one thing that comes to me more than anything else is just feels like not only is this an end of an era, but this could be the end of our Judeo-Christian heritage, that we had a godly monarch in Queen Elizabeth II, uh, her her father, uh, King George VI, was a, a godly man. He was a God-fearing man as well and played a major role during the Second World War to, to save our nation uh, and calling the nation to prayer and repentance during the Second World War. And she uh, inherited that wonderful legacy. Uh, and now we have a new king in King Charles III. And I think the verdict um, is out. We have to look at his past. We have to look at who's he, who he's associated with, uh, knowing that he's at a crossroads but also as a nation, we're also at crossroads and so is the Commonwealth. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great to be with you on the program as always, Simon. Uh, one of the concerns that I think we particularly need to hone in on is the nuanced language that he uses when speaking of his own faith and his own roots and foundations. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about his first speech to the nation and uh, some of what he said there. Not quite as convincing, uh, to say the least, as our Queen Elizabeth II and her routine professions of faith rooting herself not just in a cultural Christian ideology, but in a, a sincere, you could even say evangelical Christian um, heritage in regard to some of the traditions that, okay, yes, they're extra biblical, but they're part of our nation and they are deeply symbolic. The traditions that we would have seen many of our viewers, I'm sure, uh, in the procession today that went from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall. Uh, I, I have the question in my mind, Will this be the last of some of those traditions, even when it comes to the coronation? We've already been told to expect a significantly modernized, scaled down version of uh, the coronation. And, and one can understand okay, the need for um, good optics in a time of national economic crisis, that, that there is that. But uh, it, it may very well be that in line with King Charles III's intent on adopting and pushing forward uh, what is undeniably a neoliberal agenda that um, he, he, he may very well adopt the way of the modernist and outgoes tradition. Out, these things are of the past and it, it would be such a shame to lose some of the pageantry, some of the things that are so um, deeply a part of our national heritage. Absolutely. So just a reminder, we are live, we are interactive tonight. So uh, the big question for tonight's programme is, will Charles make a good king? So please email or text into the programme. We, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I think we've also got to, you know, because this is a, a difficult time for our nation, it's a difficult time of uh, mourning. Uh, you know, we all knew that this would, would happen. I, 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 
took everyone by surprise, even though the Queen was 96, it still has come as a massive shock um, uh, to our nation. And um, she reigned over our nation and the Commonwealth uh, since uh, 1952. Uh, the eight, and uh, that 70 years of, of being our, our monarch was absolutely incredible. So here, here's some facts. So uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, was born on the 21st of April, uh, 1926. Her name was uh, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor. Uh, she was the firstborn of the Duke and Duchess of York and the first uh, grandchild of the reigning monarch, uh, King George V, uh, who reportedly delighted in the thoughtful, well-behaved child known by the family as Lilibet. Uh, Elizabeth's father uh, ascended to the throne in 1936 as King George VI when his brother King Edward VIII abdicated uh, in order to marry the divorcee Wallis uh, Simpson. Uh, and we also have to acknowledge the role of her father, uh, King George VI, and the incredible role that he played uh, during the Second World War. And, and you only have to really watch that film called Churchill to realize um, what an extraordinary film that was, the relationship between Churchill and the king and that kind of frosty relationship at first but then um, also Queen Elizabeth II said that her favourite Prime Minister is Winston Churchill because of the role he played during World War II with her father but also uh, guiding her as monarch being, uh, uh, when she, she was his first Prime Minister and, and we got to thank King George VI uh, for calling our nation to pray and for a time of repentance during mm. the uh, whole evacuation of Dunkirk and then of course the Battle of Britain, uh, the D-Day uh, and then the final victory a a against, uh, against the Nazis which liberated our nation from an existential threat. So there could be no doubt of his spiritual stature would have, been ha would have uh, you know, really had a big impact on a young Queen Elizabeth. Well, it's important to remember that his call to the nation to pray was not a generic call. It was not a call to pray to some general idea of God or a higher power, but it was particularly to beseech the God of the Bible, the um, God um, who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ, and the, the God who brings us salvation through faith in Christ. And so, so this was an objective statement. This was calling the nation not only to pray for their salvation uh, and the salvation of those troops really in a physical way and uh, from Nazi Germany on the beaches of, of Dunkirk, but there was also in that a real testimony to uh, the reality of God's sovereignty, the God of the Bible's sovereignty over all of the events going on in the world. Um, there, there is a, a good book that t talks through some of that. Um, I believe there was a program back in the summer where it was mentioned Beyond the Odds by um, John Scribner and um, Tim Dieppe, which talks about some of those providential moments. But I, I really do believe that the king's calling the nation to prayer there was so critical. Yeah, the no. prime minister didn't do it, nor the archbishop of England at the time. It was uh, King George VI at yeah. it. So, yeah, he, he likes a lot of credit. But there is a change, isn't there, uh, from 52, uh, when Queen Elizabeth takes the throne. There's there a change is. of tone. There, there, there is, there is. And uh, this is something that w we need to recognise that the legacy that we see that God uh, gives to the kings of, uh, and the couple of queens uh, of Israel and Judah in the Old Testament was on the basis of his standard of uh, they did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, they did what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord. Um, and, and so many of the kings who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord in a relative sense and in a, a major sense we're very compromised as well because we all are fallible human beings and we do make mistakes. There is a definite change of tone when Elizabeth is going to be crowned and um, she, you know, I don't believe that this detracts from uh, the genuineness of her faith. I, I, I do believe it was very much an indicator of the influence that was already seeping into society at the time of um, sort of a multiculturalism and religious pluralism um, in, in ideology. She did ask people in uh, 1952 
to pray for her upcoming coronation. I, I want to ask you all, whatever religion you may be, uh, to pray for me on that day. Uh, to pray that God may give me wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promises I shall be making, that I may faithfully serve Him and you all the days of my life. It's a great request. It, it really is. Um, and one can see what she's doing and one can understand she's trying to be uniting, but it, it lacks that precision that her father had when calling the nation to pray to the God of the Bible, to and the, the Christian God. It wasn't a generic idea. Absolutely. And also, uh, Queen Elizabeth II inherited uh, religious responsibilities as Defender of the Faith and Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Uh, titles vested in the reigning British monarch since Henry VIII, um, renounced by the papacy in 1534. At a coronation in 1953, Her Majesty took an oath to maintain and preserve uh, the settlement of the Church of England and the doctrine of worship, discipline and government thereof as by law established uh, in England. We are live and interactive this evening and we already do have some emails and texts. Thank you all. So Tinder says, good evening to you both. Let this be for the record that I can't comment on other issues besides the Russia-Ukraine war. We're always grateful for uh, your astute comments, Satinder, on that, um, that ongoing matter. Last week, Prince Charles made a vow to continue the work his mother, the Queen, carried out before him. However, let's not forget he also made vows to Lady Diana in 1982 before God, before her, before witnesses, and before millions of viewers. These vows were then subsequently broken, and so evidently they didn't mean much to him. I appreciate there are characters in the Bible who, despite their flaws, still achieved much. However, these characters were also wholly devoted to God. My personal belief is that Prince Charles has the character traits of someone who will embrace a multi-faith, one-world religion, something his mother never would have done. Therefore, it appears he is currently ideally placed for what is to unfold in these end days. Some interesting and I think helpful comments from Satinder there. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm pretty much uh, on the same line as well. I'll also let you know that the Queen's duties included appointing archbishops, bishops, and the deans of the Church of England as advised by a prime minister. In 1970, she became the first sovereign to inaugurate and address the Church General Synod in person, uh, a practice she continued every five years. Um, after the elections. Uh, three weeks after coronation, the Queen followed an historical president and swore to maintain the Church of Scotland, honouring her duty to preserve the settlement of the true Protestant religion as established by the laws made in Scotland, uh, the Church of England in its Presbyterian and recognises only Jesus Christ as the King and Head of the Church, resulting in Her Majesty's lack of official title and participation as a regular uh, member. Now, in 2000 seems to mark a turning point in the Queen's reign where she really did come uh, public with a faith. And this is what she said on uh, Christmas Day uh, 2000 to mark the new millennium. She says, for me, the teachings of Christ are my, are my own personal accountability before God provide a framework in which I try to lead my life. And again, she said, I like so many of you have drawn great comfort in difficult times from Christ's words and ex example. And then in uh, 2002, which was uh, 20 years ago, uh, the Queen endured a very painful year uh, with, the, with the losses and the death of her sister, Princess Margaret and the Queen Mother. Uh, in that address, uh, uh, Christmas address, this is what she said, she said, I know just how much I rely on my own faith to guide me through the good times and the bad. She said, each day is a new beginning. I know that the only way to live my life is to try to do what is right, uh, to take the long view, to give my best in all that the day brings and to put my trust in God. Uh, and also, I think someone has, has commented, uh, a, a, a former a royal correspondent for The Guardian commented that she, that the Queen Elizabeth II was as fervent in her Christian faith as the uh, Puritans were in the 1600s mm. and that no other monarch has come anywhere near that. Well, faith was truly foundational for her. Uh, CBN has prepared this news item which we are happy to present to you uh, that shows just how much faith was foundational to our uh, now former Queen Elizabeth II. Bells in Britain are tolling as the nation and the world mourn the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. 
At 96 years old, she was the longest reigning monarch in British history. London Bridge is down were the code words spoken upon the Queen's death. They set in motion events leading up to the coronation of her son, King Charles III. Brody Carter brings us the story of Queen Elizabeth's life and legacy. Royal gun salutes, flowers, moments of silence and heartfelt tributes are among the commemorations in Britain and worldwide, mourning the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Because the Queen was respected around the world. United Kingdom's Prime Minister Liz Truss hailed the Queen as the rock of modern Britain. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. A double rainbow appeared in the sky over Buckingham Palace shortly before the announcement of the Queen's death, news that stunned the public. Shocked. I can't believe it. I'm gutted. Absolutely gutted. Quite shocking, really. You, you kind of always knew it was coming, but, you, but when it happens, it's just sad. Born April 21st, 1926 in London's Mayfair district, Queen Elizabeth was born to King George VI and became the Princess of Wales during the Second World War. And when her father died of cancer while she was on her honeymoon with Prince Philip, the 25-year-old princess became queen in 1952. Prime Minister Winston Churchill is among the dignitaries who watch as the Archbishop of Canterbury confirms Elizabeth's sovereignty by placing on her head the six-pound King Edward's crown. Known for her pageantry as a royal queen, her exemplary leadership, and her public statements of faith in Jesus Christ, Queen Elizabeth even developed a friendship founded in faith with the famous American evangelist Billy Graham. For me, the teachings of Christ and my own personal accountability before God provide a framework in which I try to lead my life. I, like so many of you, have drawn great comfort in difficult times from Christ's words and example. The monarch in Britain is in some ways the head of the Church of England, and she took that role very, very seriously. Nicoletta Golache, historian of British history at the University of New Hampshire, says the Queen honored that position and remembered those who served her country in wartime. She never missed a, a Remembrance Sunday when people remembered the veterans of the two world wars. In fact, this year it was, she tried very hard to make it, but her mobility and health issues got in the way. But uh, the other times she only missed it when she was pregnant. She attended church services regularly. And as you said, she gave a warming and inspiring address to the nation every single Christmas. And her handling of foreign relations along with the pageantry of the crown made her a beloved figure around the world. London Bridge is down. Those are the code words for the Queen's death spoken Thursday by her private secretary to inform the Prime Minister and the Council, setting into motion the events leading up to the coronation of her son, King Charles III. I think that this is going to shake Britain to the core, but it's also going to have an impact on people throughout the Commonwealth, um, some of whom looked upon her as a crown head, even though they uh, were living in independent countries. Great Britain recently celebrated the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, a commemoration of 70 years on the throne. Elizabeth ruled longer than any other monarch in British history. The Queen died at Balmoral Castle, her summer estate in the Scottish Highlands. That's where she's been since the month of July. Her death came shortly after an announcement from Parliament about her failing health, leading to a new monarch on the throne who will have a formal coronation, although he already took the throne upon his mother's death. He is king because the minute the spirit left the queen's body, he became the king. It is a mystical thing that happens. Britain now begins 10 days of mourning. The queen's body will be sent by train to King's Cross Station. Charles will be there with Prime Minister Truss. Now the Queen will lie in state at Westminster Hall, and the funeral will take place at Westminster Abbey. Brody Carter, CBN News. Well, it truly is an end of the age where you, you, you look at her career, uh, what she stood for, and how she stood so strong. Her Christmas addresses to the nation, to the entire world, were famous. She would write them. One of her titles, and it's a title that I think sometimes gets ignored, but one of her titles is Defender of the Faith. And here are some of the words that she wrote in one of her Christmas addresses. It was after a year of sorrow for her. I know just how much I rely on my own faith to guide me through the good times and the bad. Each day is a new beginning. 
I know that the only way to live my life is to try to do what is right, to take the long view, to give all of my best and all that the day brings, and to put my trust in God. Those are wonderful words and almost as a signature, uh, an approval from heaven, if you will, the rainbows that were over Buckingham Palace. There was also reports of a rainbow over Balmora Palace and another ra rainbow over Windsor Palace. So uh, it's like God giving a signature, well done, good and faithful. With thanks to CBN for that very helpful news report. Uh, Simon, uh, we have some emails here. I'll just re read a few of these uh, quickly. There is a question. Uh, when will King Charles be anointed with holy oil? This is from Sue in Kent. Um, Sue, this takes place at the coronation ceremony itself. So uh, King Charles III has uh, officially uh, gained the throne. He has officially become our monarch, but uh, the ceremony will officially take place at the coronation when he will take the coronation oath. It will be very interesting what he says in that. It will be next year, won't it? Give the time nation to grieve. Almost certainly. Almost certainly next, next year, spring. probably in the summer. Or the spring, I should imagine. Yeah, spring, yeah, yeah. It could, it could, could, I'm thinking maybe May, something like that um, would. Um, makes sense. Uh, it was about that length of time when the Queen um, had her coronation after her father's passing. Uh, during the ceremony, Charles is going to take the coronation oath and then he will be anointed with various oils and given the orb and the scepter before receiving St. Edward's crown, uh, which the Archbishop of Canterbury will place on the King's head. That's if everything uh, is done as it normally would be done. Yeah. Now, uh, just one more I'll, I'll read here. Do you know if the Queen had connections with the World Economic Forum? I don't think so. No. I really don't think no, so. I don't think she did, but the question is asked why? Because, as we'll see, um, our King Charles has very close connections with World Economic yeah, Forum. Closer than close connections. Yeah. Anyway, before we go on to that, I think it's also important to, to really go through uh, what the Queen uh, thought of the Bible. We've got some great quotes here. Um, she said, to what greater inspiration and counsel can we turn, she asked, than the imperishable truth to be found in this treasure house, uh, the Bible. Uh, in 2016 Christmas message, Her Majesty explained that billions of people now follow Christ's teaching and in him the guiding light for their lives. I am one of them because Christ's example helps me see the value in doing small things with great love. Whoever does them and, what, and whatever they themselves believe. Uh, she also was a close friend of uh, Billy Graham mm. and uh, Billy Graham also testified to her love for the Bible. And uh, this is what Billy Graham said in his autobiography, uh, just as I am. Uh, it says, no one in Britain has been more cordial towards us than Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II. Almost every occasion I've been with her has been a warm, informal setting, such as a luncheon or a dinner, either alone or with a few family members or other close friends. Uh, he said that uh, he, he, he rarely publicised their meetings um, and really enjoyed his friendship with her, as their friendship endured for over 60 years up until his death in uh, 2018. He wrote, I always found her very interested in the Bible and its, uh, and its message. The Queen's love of the Bible and its gospel message also led her to participate in publication of a, a very special book, a book which I, I'm actually trying to find my copy. I had a couple of copies, but I, I, may, have, I may have given them away, uh, that commemorated her 90th birthday. It's titled The Servant Queen and the King She Serves. It was co-authored by Catherine Butcher and Mark Green. It gives an overview particularly of her Christian faith, it, uh, scattered through with various stories from her life. It's um, a small, simple book uh, published by the Bible Society UK, which the Queen also served as a patron for. So uh, that as well indicates you know, just the love and value she has for the Bible. She didn't, I should say, she didn't participate in any other um, in, in any other publication. She didn't cooperate in any other official publication with an outside publisher to release any memoirs or anything like that. This is, this is what she 
uh, prioritized. Stephen Bates, The Guardian's newspaper's retired religious affairs and royal correspondent, said she is the most religious sovereign since the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. Despite declining church membership and influence in daily British life, the monarch Queen Elizabeth II remained a powerful symbol within uh, the church. British coins featured the Queen's likeness and letters in Latin that stand for, by the grace of God, Queen and Defender of the Faith. Fascinating. No, incredible. Uh, and also what's so incredible, I think, I mean, I wasn't around in 52, you weren't around in 52, I think only a few of our, our, our beloved viewers were around in 1952, but I think one thing we, we've seen with this period of mourning and the death of our monarch and uh, you know King Charles ascending to the throne and becoming King Charles III, all the ceremonies uh, that God is, is really placed at the very centre and the heart of this period of mourning for our king. But, but also, um, Reagan, uh, we have to mention the Queen and multiculturalism. But do you have any more emails before we do? I, I do, yes. Um, th thank you, Simon. Susan says, hi, guys. We can so easily judge people by what they say and not by what they do. Match the different characters of the late Queen and the new king. We can also... Uh, we can only also judge either by the media's uh, portrayal. This is evident in any high position. The Queen was dedicated to the nth degree to serve and to be the British nation's uh, and Commonwealth's guide, I think is what you, you mean to say there. Her character were, was known by many. The new king has a more universal track. We must pray for the new king to be touched by God's spirit and to be changed by the gospel. The rainbow, and uh, just for a reminder, there, 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 were th there were three. There was over Buckingham Palace, over Windsor Castle, and also... Not Windsor Palace. Would have been yes, our, our, our guy at CBN is a typical American. <laughs> he, he was messing it up there. Um, I say that as one. Um, but uh, And at Balmoral as well, there were rainbows over each, which... You know, I, I, I look at that and I don't think that's a coincidence either. I agree with you, Susan. The promise of the rainbow was that God would not destroy as previously. May God have mercy on this land, but I fear that we are under judgment. Anita says, um, it's always lovely to see you both. I had a sense of foreboding when Queen Elizabeth II passed away. The new king is very much concerned with climate change, which I feel uh, links to the one world order. We're just praying for him and Camilla daily as we always do. The Queen was Christian and she dedicated herself to this country. You use the scripture, John 5, 28. Do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Blessings and love, Anita. Excellent. So uh, let's have a look at the Queen and uh, multi-faith. Uh, the Queen as monarch extended her influence and to acknowledge and celebrate religious diversity and tolerance uh, across the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and throughout the world. Her Majesty's uh, Christmas and Commonwealth Day messages often address the theme of uh, interfaith, harmony and respectful tolerance. Leaders of various faiths and denominations regularly attended royal ceremonies, including weddings, services of thanksgiving, at the invitation of the Queen and her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, celebrating her Diamond Jubilee in uh, 2012, the, the Queen attended a multi-faith reception at uh, Lambeth Palace, hosted by the Archbishop of Canterbury, featuring the leaders of eight faiths in the United Kingdom, uh, including Buddhism, Judaism, Islam and Hinduism. At the event, this is what the Queen said. She said that faith plays a key role in the identity of millions of people providing not only a system of belief, but also a sense of belonging. It can act as a spur for social action. Indeed, religious groups have a, have a proud track record of helping those in the greatest need, including the sick, sick, the elderly, the lonely and the disadvantaged. They remind us of the responsibilities we have beyond our duties. And also in 2007, she was awarded the Three Faiths Forum Medal for her work for Interfaith. One thing, Simon, that we can say is that, and, and this may be some of what her motive was, she was the monarch of a nation that was in, increasingly multi-faith in and its makeup. And a commonwealth as well. Commonwealth as well. And so, uh, to some degree, she has to recognize that. She valued freedom of religion. She made that very clear, as, as, as we should. We, we should not suppress those of other faiths by any means. Um, at the same time, 
this is one of those areas where I think if you, you do, while they're not completely uh, comparable, if you look at the Old Testament and you look at um, some of those things that, uh, some of those moments where righteous kings messed up, it, they messed up when it came to what they said about the worship of God or what they did in relation to the worship of God. And pluralism. Exactly. So, so there were times when even they would approach things in a sincere way. Uh, they would try to worship the God of the Bible, but they wouldn't do that rightly, and they face some measure of judgment. It doesn't mean that their legacy is ruined. It doesn't even mean that, they're, um, that, that they are not in the presence of the Lord, uh, because it, uh, what only matters is God's mercy in their life that declares this person did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, right? That, but, that's but all that we matters. Know, we, this, know, though, we know the Queen's strong faith. We know that. I mean, that, yeah. that's evident. Uh, it's so evident. But couldn't she have just said in these yes. meetings that I want to acknowledge the one and true God? Uh, it says, Jesus said, I am the way, the light and the truth, and no one comes to me, it comes and, to the Father except through me. And she did, she did, I believe, actually even um, quote that in one of her more recent Christmas messages. That, that was one of the things that I think clarified if there was any question regarding, did she think there were multiple ways um, I don't think she thought there were multiple ways. Uh, someone who I, I know and have worked closely with previously knows w one of her ladies in waiting who test who's an evangelical Christian and testified that uh, Her Majesty had a very sound, solid, genuine, sincere Christian faith. Um, that there were uh, some letters regarding a decision being made by Parliament that we were encouraging her to even potentially force a constitutional crisis um, with and stand against. And she sympathized. We were told that she sympathized with um, our, our position and would relay our concerns to her ministers. But being in a constitutional monarchy, um, you, you can see, uh, if you look at the rules of things, uh, that her hands are in some ways tied. Um, I'm not even necessarily convinced that she herself signed off on the documents that were put in, in front of her. She may very well have had aides um, and, and various individuals who would do some of that work on her behalf. But uh, regardless, we, we can say she was a fallible um, woman as, as we all are fallible, as we all um, make mistakes. Um, her faith stands on the basis not of merit or demerit, but on the basis of God's mercy. Absolutely. And that's what um, we have to say. And uh, just on the last, that last note regarding um, her faith, we um, have an email uh, saying, Good evening, son Reagan. I did admire the Queen. And every Christmas, without fail, I would listen to her Christmas message. Uh, I think this, uh, unless Prince Charles changes and brings in um, God believing Christians to work with him, and I believe you're going on to say that um, things will not will not be as good. Things will not yeah. go as well. So, what can we expect as uh, Charles from Charles as our new king? Of course, he is uh, King Charles uh, the third. And now, according to the uh, Washington Post. Um, they quote uh, this particular uh, quote, which is, the Queen was very explicit about her Christian faith, but Charles is of different nature. This is according to Ian Bradley, who's a professor of cultural and spiritual history at the University of St. Andrews, uh, who's written extensively about faith and the monarchy. He says that he is more spiritual and intellectual uh, and uh, that Charles is a spiritual seeker. We also got to realise that, that uh, Charles is the first divorced monarch since uh, Henry VIII. And when it comes to uh, Charles and Christianity, of course, he addressed the nation on the day that the Queen died and Charles cited his responsibility to the Church of England. And this is what he said. He says, in which my own faith is so deeply rooted in that faith and values it inspires, I have been brought up to cherish a sense of duty to others and to hold in the greatest respect the uh, precious traditions, freedoms and responsibilities of a unique history and our system of parliamentary government. Uh, he said, it's notable how quickly he placed faith into the context of the more secular mm. values and duties. So, I mean, he's not talking specifically, I believe in Jesus Christ, I am a follower of him, 
I believe in the God of the Bible. He's more saying, I follow the traditions of the monarch and the previous uh, laws and the constitutions that previous monarchs followed. He's not saying anything about his own kind of personal faith here. And I think there's, no. a, there's a mistake here that because he um, said that he will be the defender of the faith, rather the defenders of the faith, as he said in a documentary in, in 1994, that he would change that. Uh, a lot of Christians are actually thinking that this is, that he's now kosher, um, that he's a, a Christian God, that he's going to follow uh, the his mother's example, Queen Elizabeth II, and fall on that path. But I don't think this is the case. I, he's certainly, from everything that I've read about him, he is certainly not born again. He's mm. open to multi-faith. He's fascinated with, with Islam um, and to a certain extent to Judaism as well. He, he's all supporting for multi-faith. He wants to put them on uh, Christianity on the same path as other world religions. Um, so I don't think we can actually call him a moral person, nor can we actually say that he is uh, a godly person either. No, uh, he, as one of our viewers already reminded us, has had a track record of breaking his vows and certainly much of the grief that was caused to the Queen over uh, recent decades has been a direct result of, um, of her sons, Charles and Andrew. Now, um, she, of course, cannot be judged on the basis of their actions. They are judged on the basis of their actions. And um, what, what one of our viewers asks um, how, how it is that we can um, debate how, how it is that uh, we, we can even debate whether King Charles will be a good king. After all, we believe the monarchy is anointed by God, so why are we questioning him? Well, I, I believe that the monarchy and any rule of government is sent and appointed by God for a particular purpose, um, but that doesn't mean that I do not judge by God's standards. He judges by um, his standards, and certainly, um, you know, um, we're here standing in a Christian ministry capacity, right? And um, as a pastor, I have a responsibility to shepherd the people that God has given me oversight of to um, help them think through and reflect on what matters to God when it concerns government. What is right and pleasing to God, what is not? And I cannot act like um, we can't even question. And also we don't live in the days of an absolute monarch, exactly. even though I, th I think uh, Charles may step into that territory as king. Um, I think we, we have to be objective, we have to question, um, because otherwise, you know, we all, we go into a very dangerous path of ignorance. And if we're in a place of ignorance, then we can't pray. If we have the facts presented before us, then this gives us greater discernment. It gives us a greater ability to pray into the situation. Because I tell you what, our nation right now needs so much prayer. I mean, this is what Charles said, for example, in, in a documentary in 1994, um, when he said that he, uh, he said that defender of the faith uh, than the faith. He said he questioned the impulse to prioritize one particular interpretation, i.e. Christian interpretation. Uh, people have fought to death over these things, he said, which seems to me a particular waste of people's energy when all we're actually aiming for is the same ultimate goal. And uh, he also in, in said that he preferred to embrace all religious traditions, the pattern of the divine, which I think is in all of us. Well, uh, several of our viewers have expressed misgivings, and I think those misgivings are often being linked not only to his comments that you've just read there, but also his involvement, as uh, we've been reminded of, with the World Economic Forum. Uh, according to an article in Vanity Fair, published May 22nd, 2020, entitled, Is Prince Charles Using the Pandemic to Take on Capitalism? Uh, we, we read that he has shifted his attention to the world stage, announcing a project uh, that he, uh, that this is right at the beginning of, of this, is calling Great Reset, which will call on world leaders to fix global problems made urgent by the pandemic. Now, how often have we encountered that term, the Great Reset? Don't enough programs uh, on it. Uh, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, a term that's been used uh, around the world. The, the Great Reset uh, could, could be um, seen with that, that motto, with that statement, build back better, build back better. Every world leader around, it was like they were working from a script. We're going to build back better. Uh, and all of this fits into that. But what Charles was calling Charles. for 
with uh, Klaus Schwab, the yep. head of the World Economic Forum, was to overthrow our capitalist system. Yes, yeah. That's what I mean, Build Better I mean, means. I, I, it means actually yeah. tear down the, the real foundations of healthy So everything society. that, you know, with everyone who's, uh, you know, working, uh, have, have, uh, have their jobs, uh, earn their, their money, we can buy what we want, uh, we can go where we want. Uh, we have uh, freedom within a capitalist economic system. It's not perfect. We know that because there are, there are big gaps between the rich uh, and, and the poor, and you get that in the capitalist system because you have winners and losers. Um, but essentially, that means that if you get rid of our capitalist system and overthrow it, what do you replace it with? Uh, a socialist authoritarian government. Uh, and that's essentially what he's calling for. So, I mean, it's, it, the, the Daily Telegraph reported um, his announcement on the 22nd of May uh, 2020. And it says, uh, according to Del Daily Telegraph, Prince Charles is to launch the Great Reset project to rebuild the planet in the wake of the coronavirus. Uh, the Prince of Wales hopes to convince world leaders to capitalise on this unique but narrow window uh, to put the planet and the people first. Uh, the Prince of Wales will call upon world leaders to capitalise on this unique and narrow window. Uh, and he also says that we have to uh, launch the Great uh, Reset Project, recognising the vital importance of international cooperation to maximise the potential of this approach. The Great Reset Initiative is being launched by the Prince and Professor Schwab on the 3rd of June as a way to bring ideas, strategies, initiatives together from around the world for a higher impact, i.e. world government. Uh, the Prince is to co-host the event with the founder of the World Economic Forum to bring about a green recovery encouraging businesses and politicians sure that they build back better as they cope with the repercussions of the COVID-19 crisis. The Prince, who has long advocated for climate change and the health of the planet to be placed at the heart of uh, economies, will work with Klaus Schwab on the event due to take place online on the 3rd of June. This is 2020. Uh, it's intended to build on the Sustainable Market Initiative launched by the Prince in Davos in January in a bid to accelerate the global transition to sustainable markets and decarbonisation. And of course, that we are living through these disastrous policies right now. I mean, he's a, he's a climate alarmist. Now, I do believe that the world is going through a, a form of climate change. I do believe that uh, the world is heating up. But I think it's one of these natural cycles. I don't think this is man-made. And yet we see the likes of, 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 uh, of uh, um, the leader of the World Economic, Klaus Schwab. Uh, we also hear it from uh, our world leaders as well, including our former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, of course his wife uh, Carrie is heavily involved in this, that we are facing an uh, uh, ecological apocalypse uh, in the near future and that we only have we are one minute to midnight to save the planet. I don't believe that this is the case. Instead, I think this is being used to bring in a dark, sinister um, agenda. And of course, what this has done by our government pursuing this policy of zero carbon emissions is it's destroying our way of life. It's destroying mm. our businesses. We have abandoned reliable uh, uses of energy. And this is why we're heading into this energy crisis that is costing our government over 200 billion pounds. And it's costing people their lives because they can't afford to keep the gas and electric going and our systems are such that we become so reliant on these commodities. Um, now, Charles spoke at the uh, UN Climate Change Forum. Um, he gave a speech at the opening ceremony of COP26 in Glasgow, uh, viewers may remember. Uh, I believe we talked uh, about that um, at, at least once last year, 1st of November of 2021. Uh, he spoke in a way, I think it's fair to say, Simon, the Queen very rarely meddled in political issues. She, she very rarely showed uh, her hand in regard to her views on a number of things. People could sometimes read between the lines and speculate. Uh, but we never really found her giving a massive speech along these lines uh, in her capacity as the Queen. Now, will this change now that Charles is King? I'm not convinced it will change. I think this might just ramp up. I think he is going to be very much a hands-on King in, in this way. 
Um, and if he does, it calls, uh, this will certainly cause a constitutional crisis. Now, yes. let, let's, I just want to read an extract. Uh, and maybe some of our viewers are more intelligent than us uh, and are more switched on uh, and can help us interpret what this actually means. So uh, in his speech on the 1st of November in, uh, in Glasgow at the uh, UN uh, Climate Summit, he says this. We know that it will take trillions. In other words, he's talking about um, stopping uh, going to renewable energy, closing down coal-fired uh, power stations, stopping our kind of carbon emissions. And he says this, we know this will take trillions, not billions of dollars. We also know that countries, many of whom are burdened by growing levels of debt, simply cannot afford to go green. Here we need a vast military-style campaign, a vast military-style campaign um, to marshal the strength of the global private sector with trillions at its disposal, far beyond the global GDP, and with the greatest respect beyond even the governments of world leaders. It offers the only real prospect of achieving fundamental economic transition. Have you any idea what he's talking about? Well, it almost seems as if this is code for supporting a world government, and if we can't impose what we want to do, then we need to set up uh, a military style campaign to, mm. to marshal the strength. In other words, we'll use That's force to bring about what we want to achieve. Liz tells us um, we should not question other people's beliefs, nor should we question King Charles's faith either. Uh, Liz 100% disagree because uh, the, the very rooting of, of faith, a very core part of faith, is asking questions and having those questions answered. Uh, we do not all believe the same thing, um, nor can we act like we believe the same thing. And when it comes to King Charles, uh, we judge not on the basis of his eternal state, uh, we judge not on the basis of merit, uh, but we, we must do what Jesus calls us to, what the scriptures repeatedly call us to, and um, look for fruit um, that's there and speak prophetically into that, which is what we see case after case in the scriptures um, the, the prophets do. Uh, there are many viewers who are exp expressing their um, concerns over some of what we've um, talked about, but I think as we begin to bring the program to um, a, a close, this is a, a very good a statement by Emily. Very good to have this discussion. We need to pray for Charles. Do we believe the Holy Spirit can change people, especially when we pray? Great reminder, Emily. Absolutely, we believe that. God can change the, uh, the, the king's heart, and it is our prayer uh, that he will change his heart, that he will open King Charles III's eyes and cause him to see uh, the truth of who he is and who he desires him to be. It's interesting, I came across uh, uh, this article when I was researching for this program uh, this afternoon, and this is from the uh, CambridgeGlobalist.org on King Charles III. This was written on the 21st of December 2014, talking about the time uh, when our, our, our monarch uh, would die and that uh, Charles would uh, um, ascend to the throne. It says, at the time of the Elizabeth coronation in 1953, Kinsley Martin, the socialist editor of the Socialist New Statement, summarised better than anyone this paramount virtue of the British system. Constitutional monarchy is a, a subtle device which enables us, anthropology speaking, both to uh, adore and kill our kings. By dividing supreme authority into two, we can lavish adulation upon the crown and kick out the governments when we choose. But if and when Charles ascends to the throne and continues to extensively express political biases, we will have a constitutional monarch attempting to take on some of the powers of an absolute monarch. Uh, and this is, I think, the, the, the great danger. Also, we know that in uh, 2011, um, we saw that uh, uh, when he was prince then, Prince Charles was uh, writing letters to, uh, to ministers of state, directing them and guiding them on policies that they should be taking. The, uh, the Guardian wanted to publish those letters. 
that uh, Prince Charles wrote at the time. Uh, and this was overruled by the Attorney General because this would damage uh, the relationship between the government and the monarch. So he's in, he has a track record of this and it, it's something that we need to be aware of because if he starts to push through some of his maybe his economic uh, pol policies he wants to see or certainly the, uh, the environmental policies that he wants being enacted uh, and causes problems for the government then potentially we have a constitutional crisis that would bring the monarchy into dispute and uh, yeah cause our country in, uh, huge problems. Michael has uh, something interesting to say here. Dear presenters, I'm sure you know that the title Defender of the Faith was first given to King Henry VIII by Pope Leo X. Yep. Or uh, pluralism, I'm often reminded that Jesus praised the action of the Samaritan, not the priest of the Levi, etc. Maybe pluralism is not all bad. Also, it was a Samaritan woman who received Jesus with such joy at the well. Some people regard her as the first evangelist in the New Testament. Food for thought, maybe. Michael, um, well, they half Jewish, the Samaritans. I, you know, this is talking about ethnicity, not religious belief. Um, the Samaritans were uh, that they had they had sinned. The scriptures are, are clear about that. They had merged uh, their Jewish faith. They had merged belief in Yahweh, the God of um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with the pagan beliefs of the Assyrians. They were those who had intermarried with the Assyrians in the northern kingdom of Israel, which never came back. If you remember, there was no remnant of Israel left. The Samaritans were the result of that. Um, but, so, yes, you're, you're right. Jesus praises the action of the Samaritan. Not, he doesn't look and say his, his beliefs. He doesn't... It's, it's not about that there. It's about his actions showing, um, showing love for his neighbor. Um, at the same time, the Samaritan woman, I love that story. It's one of my favorite stories. I use it all the time when talking about discipleship and evangelism because here's a woman who, uh, she comes to faith in the Messiah. It's not that she continues in her false belief. She embraces true belief. She embraces true faith. So it's really not about pluralism at all. Thank you, though, for your email. Uh, we're down to the last uh, three minutes of the program, so very much uh, thank you for, for watching uh, tonight's program. And uh, we really have to sum up. I, I think spiritually uh, our nation is at a real crossroads. Uh, we are in a new era. Um, and could Queen Elizabeth II be our, our last uh, relic of our Judeo-Christian heritage? And that choice uh, is with... Uh, Charles himself, that he has a choice. He has a choice to follow in the footstep of his mother, take his wisdom on board. And also we know that, that William is very keen on doing this or whether we're going to see that uh, uh, King Charles III will follow his uh, friend in, in uh, Klaus Schwab and trying to push through the World Economic Forum's agenda, moves towards world government, uh, moves towards a one world religion. Um, the choice is here for him, but it also has a huge impact upon our nation and direction our nation takes spiritually. Um, this is why so much is at stake and this is why we did this program because we need to pray and intercede uh, for our new king. Thankfully, Absolutely. in our national anthem, it says, uh, God save the king. Yeah. So uh, every time that is sung, people are declaring, God save the king. And it's right that viewers, I accept that many have these concerns, concerns for a long time, um, but King Charles is your king. He is the king of um, this nation, if indeed you're a citizen of the United Kingdom. And you have that responsibility before God to pray for him. Um, our new king is not only um, with the nation mourning the passing of the queen, he is mourning the passing of his mother, um, as is his family, their close relative. And so it is right that you um, mourn with those who mourn, weep with those who weep, um, and, and that in um, your discernment, in the discernment of these issues, you, you prioritize praying for him, as Simon has just reminded us. Um, we're called to pray for kings, for all who are in authority. Uh, King Charles, regardless of the road he takes, uh, remains an image bearer of the one true God who we all will give account to one day. So let's pray and look to ourselves and ask that we um, ask whether or not we are right with God as well in these times. And may he revive our nation, may he heal our nation and comfort those who are in their grief. This is Behind the Headlines. Thank you for joining us. We'll hope to see you again next week. God bless you all.